Um, welcome everyone. My name is Miriam Kadosh and I'm the Education and Patient Engagement Officer at the Melanoma Research Foundation. We are so pleased to have you join us today for this wonderful educational opportunity entitled Speak for Melanoma, Engaging the Melanoma Community in Advocacy at Home and with Policymakers. Our goal today is to share a bit about our advocacy program with you and let you hear from our experienced melanoma advocates. And we also wanna empower you to make positive change in your own community. Our mission at the MRF is to eradicate melanoma by accelerating research while educating to and advocating for the melanoma community. We know that education is critical for patients to make informed decisions about their care. We are grateful to ISI for the generous support of this webinar series and investment in the MRF's mission. A quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. We encourage you all to use our Q&A box to ask questions throughout the session. Um, and the information presented during today's session is for educational purposes and any individual treatment questions should be directed to your healthcare provider. We encourage everyone to visit melanoma.org to learn more about the resources we have available. Also, this session will be available for viewing later as part of our videos on demand library that you can share with others. And just one more quick note to let you know that we will be having an evaluation feedback form pop up at the end of today's session. So when you exit our Zoom screen today, it will come up for you. So make sure you feel, fill that out. Feedback is so very important to us. Okay, well, let's get on with our presentation. Um, today, we are joined by our advocacy officer and three patient advocates. I will introduce all of them to you all now. So Kim Watkins is our advocacy officer and she joined the MRF in July, 2022. She oversees our federal and state legislative and regulatory policy agenda and advocacy. Prior to joining the MRF, she served as the policy and advocacy manager at the American Neurological Association, harnessing the power of patients and physicians advocating together on behalf of urologic conditions such as prostate, kidney, and bladder cancers. In addition, Kim has been a strong advocate for children's health through her work with the South Carolina Immunization Coalition, the Bradshaw Institute for Community Child Health and Advocacy, and as the founder of the parent-to-parent peer-led education group, South Carolina Parents for Vaccines. Kim's innovative approach to vaccine education and policy change attracted the attention of NPR, Kaiser Health News, and the CDC. In 2019, she was awarded the Childhood Immunization Champion Award and selected as the CDC's National Award Spokesperson. Kim has been featured on BBC, BBC One, NPR's All Things Considered, and Kaiser Health News. We're so excited to have you, Kim. Our three advocates I'm going to introduce now. Our first advocate is Terry Lynn Pugnetti. Terry Lynn is a seventh grade educator residing in Denver, Colorado. She is a stage four cutaneous melanoma survivor and has been 27 years, no evidence of disease. Terry Lynn has been an advocate, volunteer, and phone buddy with the Melanoma Research Foundation since 2016. Terry Lynn began using tanning beds at the age of 15 and now chooses to educate teens and young adults about the harmful effects of the sun and indoor tanning. Our second advocate is Kristen Steiner. Kristen is a successful marketing professional with over 22 years of experience in search engine optimization, project management, and marketing communications. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in business administration and a master's degree in marketing from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And our third advocate today is Jennifer Schultz. Jen is an educator, speaker, and writer with a background in digital marketing, social media management, and event planning. After receiving both her bachelor's and master's degree from Concordia University in St. Paul, Minnesota, she is actively involved in the community she now calls home. In addition to teaching public 
speaking at her alma mater, she serves on the athletics committee of their alumni advisory council and works as an academic coach at Athletes Committed to Students, ACES, where she works with middle school students from underrepresented communities, using sports to engage them in math and social emotional learning. As a four-time melanoma survivor, Jen is passionate about spreading melanoma awareness and educating her community on sun safety. She's a certified melanoma educator through the Melanoma Research Foundation and has built a community of other cancer survivors, thrivers, and warriors through her website, jenpatrice.com, and her podcast, Company You Keep. Kim, would you like to kick us off by providing us with an overview of the advocacy work that the MRF is doing alongside you? Absolutely. And thank you for um, such a kind introduction, Miriam. Hi, everyone. My name is Kim Watkins. As Miriam said, I am the advocacy officer with the MRF. And it is my pleasure to introduce um, our advocacy program and help kind of paint the picture of where advocacy fits in within the greater MRF mission so that you can get a better understanding of just why it is that advocacy in the melanoma community is so necessary. So just a bit of background on the MRF. We were founded in 1996 by a patient. Her name was Diana Ashby. And she really realized that there was a big gap when it came to melanoma research. Those who have been in this space for a while might recall that back in the mid nineties, there really were no treatments for melanoma, unfortunately. And so Diana created the MRF to bridge that gap, to invest in that research that was so critical. And that is the reason why so many are here today. Through her vision and really her legacy, we have now, we have now grown to have a tripartite mission across research, education, and advocacy for the entirety of the melanoma community. And similar to our tripartite mission is our advocacy programs uh, four kind of pillars that help us drive outcomes and targeted advocacy across prevention, access, research, and education. To date, some of our notable achievements as an advocacy program and an organization include $40 million in melanoma research uh, program funding. That's through the Defense Appropriations Bill. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, we have successfully advocated for no copay legislation in Illinois, and it's been introduced in Florida. Unfortunately, it did not pass this session, um, but no copay legislation would provide an annual skin cancer screening um, at no cost, performed by a dermatologist at no cost to a patient. So no deductibles, no copays, no coinsurance. We have advocated for the inclusion of rare subtypes in the melanoma research program. Um, we've held meetings with the FDA on both ocular melanoma and indoor tanning beds, and we provided comments to the National Institutes of Health, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and lawmakers to help guide policy. I like to include this slide because, um, like a lot of people before I worked in advocacy, before I engaged in advocacy in my personal life, I really didn't see or understand necessarily how what happened in DC affected my life, my family's life. A lot of people kind of view um, advocacy as so far removed from their individual experience. But in truth, advocacy is more like this. It shapes the foundation and it lays that um, environment that you need if you want to have healthy individuals, if you want to drive healthy outcomes. And so when we apply that framework to the MRF's advocacy program, across those four pillars, it looks like prevention that supports and promotes a culture of melanoma prevention ranging that might look like uh, state proclamations. If you've seen our LinkedIn, you saw that the state of Texas declared May Melanoma Awareness Month, which was very exciting. And that was thanks to the work of our advocates. Um, it might look like a tanning bed ban for people under the age of 18 at the federal level or state level. Moving into access, it means that we recognize that each individual's journey with melanoma is unique 
And so we advocate for policies that enhance both quality and quantity of life. You'll hear more about a few of our uh, access priorities in just a few slides. Research is central to our mission. It is what we do. And so we also recognize that without appropriate funding, there is, there is no research to speak. And it is so critical for so many families facing this disease. And so we advocate for research that is fully funded in all areas where melanoma research occurs. And then lastly, education. We believe in empowered and educated advocates who can speak to the issues, who have the confidence to have a meeting with a lawmaker um, so that they can take that advocacy muscle and build it up. Really briefly, this is a non-exhaustive list of our federal and state uh, priorities, but just to give you I, an idea of how we engage as an organization. Um, some of our prevention priorities have included an FDA tanning bed ban that would um, ban tanning beds for individuals under the age of 18. Currently, 22 states in DC have a tanning bed ban in place for people under the age of 18, but that's, of course, as we know, early exposure to tanning beds increases your risk of melanoma significantly. And so an FDA rule would prohibit anyone for under the age of 18 from using a tanning bed nationwide, regardless of if they live in one of those states or not. We also, through our partnerships and coalitions, work to ensure that K through 12 students have access to sunscreen during school hours or activities without the need for a physician's note or going to the school nurse, for example. When we move into access, when we engage in access, some of our top issues have been no copay state bills. Um, we are working with state lawmakers to expand access to skin cancer screenings because we know that melanoma is most treatable and patients have the best outcomes when we detect it early, when it's in its most treatable stages. And then passion, one of my passion projects is telehealth. Um, Telehealth remains an important tool for everyone in the melanoma community. We believe that patients and physicians have demonstrated that telehealth does belong in melanoma care, uh, particularly through COVID. And we are here to ensure that no one loses access when the public health emergency ends, um, which unfortunately just happened last week. <clears throat> and then our research priorities kind of fall into um, appropriations, which is the term. Um, that that's the time of year, that's the process through which Congress funds institutes like the National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, um, as well as that $40 million of defense funded research. That's the Melanoma Research Program is part of the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, or we just call it CDMRP because that's a tongue twister. We also have engaged in clinical trial diversity because we recognize that there are a lot of barriers for patients to participating in a clinical trial and cost shouldn't be one of them. So we, at our most recent advocacy days back in March, advocated for lawmakers to reintroduce the Diverse Trials Act, which would address the indirect, allow researchers to fund the indirect costs associated with participating in a clinical trial, like a hotel room or airfare, for example. And if any of this sounds of interest to you, there are so many ways you can get involved. Uh, one of the easiest is to sign up for our advocacy newsletter. It's on the MRF website. You can also come to our advocacy days. It's a great experience. Our patient advocates who have joined us tonight will tell you more about it in just a few minutes, but it's always in early March and it's in Washington, DC. If you're really interested in research, um, you could become an MRF grant reviewer or a MRP, CDMRP, um, consumer reviewer. If that's of interest to you, please email advocacy at melanoma.org for more information. Or if some of those state bills like sunscreen in schools or tanning bed bans or no copay sound of interest, shoot me an email at advocacy at melanoma.org and we can um, talk more about that, what that might look like in your area. And so without further ado, I will, um, I have the pleasure of now having a conversation with our patient advocates who can tell you more about 
what it's like to go from being a patient to an advocate, what it looks like to go to a Hill Day to meet with lawmakers to work in your local communities. And so Terry Lynn, you went from diagnosis to working in your local community to educate and raise awareness about melanoma and sun safety. So how did you identify that as a need? I've been teaching in Colorado for about 27 years and I have um, middle school students. And so little by little, like one of our units, we had to um, do nonfiction and, and research. And I just started sharing my story with them and started researching tanning beds. And we I started looking at all the dangers of that and how to like pinpoint keywords. Um, and then from there, I just realized like many kids were asking about their, their parents and their loved ones that were working in Colorado with us being so close to the sun, you know, it was almost like my students made the connection. They, with us being so close to the sun and them having parents, you know, that had immigrated here from Mexico, a lot of them worked outside with landscaping and, you know, many of them were in construction and stuff like that. So they, they wanted to, you know, also make their families and stuff be aware. So for several years, I would kind of do my own little fundraiser and stuff at the school level um, just to get people interested. Um, I was going to try to get people in for free screening and stuff like that. And it just, it was really hard to make the context. But once I finally uh, reached out and found the Melanoma Research Foundation, I was able to get posters and stuff and put them up for um, Melanoma Awareness Month. And then I, I we also advertise um, I'm not really advertised, but like on our school announcements, we try to make people aware of that. Um, just because Colorado is so close to the sun, um, that's part of it. And I guess um, once I started realizing that, you know, I began tanning when I was a teenager. Um, so I was in and out tanning beds every single day. Um, and I see kids today still doing that in Colorado. Um, which is kind of a shame because like we've got kids that tan before the prom and tan before homecoming and stuff like that. But Colorado does not have a ban currently on um, on minors using tanning beds. So that is something I'm very passionate about. I think it definitely needs to change. Um, and then little by little, I, I still see like several people that I teach with are very athletic. Colorado is a very athletic and environmentally aware uh, area. And so a lot of people, I think, exercise and do bodybuilding and stuff. And then in their world and all of our, you know, um, all of our workout facilities and stuff all have tanning beds in them. And so even people I work with, you know, still tan on a, on a regular basis. And I just, it makes me scowl, <laughs> but, but I do, I try my best. And so at the state level, I do want to do that. I am very excited that I was able over the past, well, since 2016, um, I've been involved with MRF and I have done the Miles for Melanoma Gala. I mean, Miles for Melanoma and the Denver Gala that we have each year. Um, and then I've also gone to Hill Day, uh, the Advocacy Days in DC. I want to say five times. Oh, wow. Somewhere around there. So yeah, I'm glad to be involved because there wasn't anything like this for me when I was diagnosed in 1995. Good. So you you became an advocate long after your initial diagnosis. Yes. Yes. I was very ashamed for, for a really long time because, you know, I didn't know any better and growing up without sunscreen and whatever, um, I think being a lifeguard and being on the East Coast and near the beach and stuff, it just had me in that mindset. And then in the winter time, I just started tanning at the age of 15. And so I, I tanned religiously um, for the years as a lifeguard. And then as the years I worked at a tanning salon in the winter time. Um, so then I was diagnosed at the age of 25. Um, but at, even then I was still going in the tanning, tanning beds. It was embarrassing. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of engaging the youth, Kristen, um, you've involved your daughter in advocacy days. And in fact, that's, that's where we met. Um, can you kind of to Terry Lynn's point about engaging her students about, you know, modeling these behaviors um, to younger and younger audiences, can you share why you decided to include your daughter in your efforts and what effect do you think that visible, you know, modeling uh, has to the broader melanoma community, but especially to our teens? 
Um, yeah, so I, I was diagnosed in 2016. Um, I did my first advocacy days in 2018. And, um, at that time I did not have my daughter come with me. Um, and that first experience for me was so eye-opening. I, didn't realize how how much goes into um getting funding for research. I didn't realize the process behind it. Um, I've never experienced anything like that. Um, I've never known people who do work like you do, Kim, um, on like a government level and um, you know, working with lawmakers and stuff. And so it was so fascinating to me. Um, I learned so much about a disease that, uh, you know, that I had, not only do I have the disease, but that I um, just didn't realize all the ins and outs and all the different subtypes and it, it, all, so many things. So it was very fascinating, that first experience. Um, and when I came home from that trip, I was really excited to share everything I'd learned um, and just the experience in general about, um, you know, meeting with our lawmakers and um, and learning about kind of the latest and greatest um, treatments and things like that that are available. Um, I was so, just really excited and thrilled to share it with my family and friends and my daughter, um, who is you know, my biggest supporter, she was super interested and she just thought it was really cool. And, um, she, she asked, she wanted to, to come. And, um, I was a little bit hesitant at first, but then I thought, you know, it's actually will be a great experience for her. Um, and it was, it's, she's come, I think twice now. And, um, not only do we have a lot of fun when we go, we, um, we go and explore DC and all that it has to offer. And we have a great time, but, um, we get to meet, uh, lots of other advocates. We get to meet with our lawmakers and, um, she gets to learn about the process. And I think, um, I think that's something that it, it is hard to learn in a classroom, you know? Um, and so the fact that she's there and she's actually doing it, and then she came back to, to school and, and um, she actually had a, a teacher whose husband had passed away from melanoma and she had told this teacher she was coming to advocacy days. And then the teacher asked her to share her experience. And, you know, she just was just passing on the message. Um, that was, and so I just, for me, advocacy starts literally with your family and friends, the people who are immediately around you and just letting them know, um, you know, educating them and, uh, and, and that's what I did. Um, and so it's, it's just been a wonderful experience. And, and just as, you know, a proud mama, it, it was so great to see her. Um, she's not a shy person at all. So it's, but it's great to see her like walk into those, uh, you know, offices and just take charge and be like, this is what we're here to talk about today. And, you know, I couldn't be more proud and and I know that she's passing on the message um to her peers and her you know social group and as well so it was the decision to do it was actually pretty easy um but she's really taken the ball and run with it so well I would say you have too so I'm sure <laughs> As proud of you of her as you are, I'm sure it works both ways because um, you know you've really our our Colorado delegation was truly a powerhouse at advocacy days. So all of you were just incredible advocates 
Um, and there's there's this theme I'm noticing with each and every one of you, there's a really strong education component to the advocacy work you've all engaged in, whether, you know, as Kristen just pointed out in your own, your friends, your family, your greatest sphere of influence, Terry Lynn, you know, by, you know, nature of what you do as a profession and where your passion is, you're, you, you're working with kids and Jen, you are too. Um, and Jen, you actually started out um, as a melanoma a certified melanoma educator with the MRF. So how did you make that jump from advocating to, you know, other melanoma patients, other melanoma caregivers, other people in the space or would be patients um, to advocating to members of Congress? What, what kind of flipped that switch for you? Yeah, so it's interesting because I feel like I didn't seek out advocacy. Advocacy sort of found me. I was first diagnosed in 2015. And at that time, I just really leaned into the community and wanted to get to know other people that had shared experiences. And then unfortunately from, it was March of 2021 to February of 2022, I had three melanoma recurrences. And so after that first one, I just, I was starting to feel like I wasn't in control of myself and my body and my healthcare and all of that anymore. And that was when I started to do more research at different organizations and how I could get involved. And that was when I found the class to become a certified melanoma educator through the MRF. And I took that. And then of course, when I signed up for that, started to get on the newsletters. I know some of those you mentioned in your presentation. And so I was just getting a lot more information and stuff as it came about. And it was actually my community that really ended up initially steering me into advocacy. So another one of our um, melanoma community members that actually went to advocacy days in March, I saw that she had signed up to do it virtually two years ago. And I was like, this is so cool. Like, how do you get to do that? You're going to Congress, you're making big change. How do I be a part of that? And so I signed up and I did it virtually that first year, which would have been I guess 2022. <laughs> it was just only a little over a year ago. So um, this year I got to go back and actually go in person, which is such, it's hard to even put it into words. It's a really undescribable, really empowering experience. Um, and so I got to go and meet up with other people that were really involved in advocacy. But in between, I really found that it gave me a sense of purpose. And so then I started even leaning into advocacy work here in my local community as well. That was great. We love to hear it. It's advocacy is a muscle. And once you build it, you know, you just, you can apply it to so many other things. And that's, that's wonderful that, you know, you've engaged. So, you know, feet first, but you're doing it and you're doing your, I had the pleasure of being in a Hill meeting uh, with Jen, with uh, Congresswoman McCollum's staff and she was flawless. She, if she was nervous, you never would have guessed it. Um, and you just did such a great job of relating your, your story to the things we were advocating for um, from members of Congress. And that is truly a skill. Um, and, you know, kind of getting back to that sense of community, um, which I know is, is so important for anyone facing any kind of diagnosis. It's, uh, the need to be around and to hear from people who have gone through it, um, who understand kind of where you are, who can offer that perspective, that guidance. Um, Kristen, when you were first diagnosed, uh, you and I have had a conversation where you mentioned you were looking for that sense of community for people who understood, you know, understood you, understood melanoma. And once you found that connection, um, what was the impact or feeling you experienced advocating with those who, who have walked that similar journey? Oh my gosh. Um, it was amazing to finally, uh, meet other melanoma patients. Um, and I think the first time I really, uh, met anybody, that also had melanoma was at um, a Miles for Melanoma race, like team captain little meeting we had prior to the race. Um, I didn't know anybody 
um, who, who had this disease, uh, I would mention it to people. They didn't know what it was. They had never heard of it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so just finally meeting people, um, who were either patients themselves or, um, you know, caregivers, what have you, um, was so amazing because this is such a unique, it's such a unique disease and the treatments and things for it are so unique, um, very different than any other types of cancers. Um, and it just made me feel less alone. And one of the greatest things about um, meeting uh, other patients is that then we, you know, then we got on our social networks, Facebook and Instagram and what have you, and we um, became friends there. We just, just how it is with your normal, you know, everyday thing. You start liking each other's posts, you see what that person's doing, um, you know, and it, 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 it gives me thoughts, it gives me ideas. And I'm like, hey, you know, and there's people on Facebook um, in the community who um, have like wonderful, wonderful posts, um, not only like sharing their story, but just, um, sharing their own, uh, how they're advocating. And I, I on the regular will reach out to them and be like, I love this post. I'm going to steal it. Is that okay? I'm going to share it with my people. Um, and it just, it just makes you feel, it just makes you feel better because melanoma is scary. And, and just knowing that you don't have to walk it alone and that the MRF is, is there and, and yes, you're this big organization and you, um, you, you know, host all these things and give us so much great information and stuff like that. But it's really the people that I've been introduced to um, through the MRF and through the different um, ways I advocate through the MRF. Um, and also, I, I got to say, you know, melanoma sucks, but we sure have a good time when we're at the gala and at the Miles for Melanoma and advocacy days. We have a great time. I love seeing everybody. It's, it's so much fun. Well, that, that is wonderful to hear. Um, and so speaking of the fun that is advocating together um, with people who, you know, you, you meet, you build a relationship with over years I'm guessing we have a lot of people who are joining this webinar right now who have never been to any Hill Day, not, not just you know with the MRF, but anywhere. And all of you have. So as the resident experts, um, and Terry Lynn, you know, we'll circle, we'll start with you. Um, can you kind of describe a Hill Day for, for people um, so they have an idea of when we say that, what that actually means? Sure. Um, when I first started, I was terrified because I had never done anything like that before. And I was like, little old me, I'm just a teacher. I, you know, <laughs> like I can't be talking to someone in the Senate. Um, but I cannot, I, I was so impressed with the MRF for giving us like a whole day of training and laying everything out, um, the statistics and our asks and and how the whole process works. And so all that information, I, I was just soaking it up like a sponge. And then, um, I, you know, I would just take notes during all of that. And when it finally came down to, you know, divvying up who was going to say what, um, we did a good job with that. And then, I don't know, I mean, I guess once we met with the people, we realized we're meeting with their staffers and not so much the big guy. Um, then it made it much more comfortable because um, a lot of them were just fresh out of college. And so they just, you know, were very much like, got it, got it. Okay. You got this ask. We're going to go for this. We're going to go for this. And they were so positive um, and like loved what they were hearing that uh, it just, it just made it easier and easier to come back and to get those thoughts and not 
you know, like I was able to organize my thoughts and my words. Like I didn't have the vocabulary at first. I was, I was worried about all kinds of stuff, but um, it's, it's gone pretty smooth. And like Kristen said, it's so nice to see some of the same faces year after year. And so, you know, for anybody who's, I guess, apprehensive or doesn't want to start there, I would highly rec recommend it just because you can get so much information and you're, you're not only educating yourself, but now you're tying your story in with like even with the clinical trial part or whatever part it is that you're asking. So like I can relate to the clinical trial and the indoor tanning and it just makes it, I don't know, it's like a nice bridge way, if that's the right word. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's really insightful. So thank you. Um, and Jen, you you know, as one of our newer advocates, and especially as someone who started in the virtual space, uh, talking about Hilde, what what were some of your takeaways having done it both virtually and in person now? I was really glad that I did it virtually first, just because it felt less intimidating. You're behind a screen. I could have my notes like out of view of the screen. Um, so with Ask, I wasn't maybe as comfortable with. I had that for a backup, I guess you could say. And then, but I'm so glad now that we're back in person because there's truly nothing like everyone getting together. You're together essentially for three days. The first evening that we're there, we have activities and a dinner and things like that. The next day, it's a full day of getting information, learning more about the ask. We're even finding out, you know, new advancements and maybe information that we don't already know, which is very hopeful. And then you're getting together with the people, if you're fortunate enough to have other people in your state that are also attending, you get to meet them if you don't know them, kind of share and map out how you guys are going to have your meetings and all of that stuff. And then if anyone is nervous about it, I would say the Melanoma Research Foundation does a great job of making sure that you are never alone. And so don't let that intimidate you. And which Kim, you mentioned that you were in one of my sessions when we met with Betty McCollum's office. It was because otherwise I would have actually been in that session alone. I had others with me in my first two meetings of the day. And then the last one, I was fortunate enough to have Kim join me. And really one of my biggest takeaways, which is why I find this so like empowering, but also healing and giving purpose is our staff are actually, I got a little bit emotional in it. It was kind of the end of the day, all the letdown of the emotions and the staffer actually thanked me for taking the time. I feel so grateful I had their time. And she thanked me for taking the time and sharing our stories and said, hearing from their constituents, how what we're asking for directly impacts people in their districts and areas is what they can take to the floor and really make a difference and explain why these policies matter and we need to implement them. Yeah, you are absolutely right. Um, when you go to the Hill, uh, you are meeting with your lawmakers, the people that you um, see on your ballot when you go to vote. These are, they are accountable to you. And so they want to hear from you, facts and data and statistics. Um, <clears throat> They have a place in advocacy, but they can't paint the whole picture. And that's why we really, really, really encourage patients, caregivers, um, survivors, thrivers to, to be there, to have that authentic conversation with a lawmaker and their staff, um, because you can't replicate that no matter how hard you try. Um, and Kristen... I guess I will uh, kind of put this to you. We've we've got a few more questions here before we turn it over to our audience. Um, and this is free to everyone if you wanna um, chime in here. But Kristen, what advice would you have for others who are looking to get involved? Um, I would just say start in your immediate circle make a Facebook post, make an Instagram post, um, sign up for the MRF advocacy newsletter, tons of great information that comes from that, gives you lots of um, opportunities to, to go bigger if you want. But if you can start, you start small. One of the first things that I did 
was I, I became a certified melanoma educator like Jen did. Um, and I went and I spoke at my son's school and I gave a little presentation about um, sun safety and, you know, the importance of wearing sunscreen and, and things like that. Um, just to his like third grade class, it was really, <laughs> you know, it was, it, it was so fun. Actually, it was, the kids were amazing. They had tons of good questions for me. Um, and that was great. And then another, you know, another thing I personally uh, am not involved in this group, but, um, I have lots of friends who are big motorcycle riders and they hold, they have, you know, motorcycle meetings and things like that. And one of my friends asked me to come and speak about, um, you know, sun safety and, and that kind of stuff to the group, um, you know, cause they're, they're exposed. Um, some people don't wear helmets, which, you know, that's your personal choice, but, um, there's, it's usually an older group. I, I, there's a lot of bald heads out there, things like that. And I'm like, you guys wear your leathers and your eyewear and all this kind of stuff. You're protecting your body in case you have a, a, a crash or a fall on your motorcycle, but, um, you need to be protecting your skin when you're just out riding and enjoying that sunshine and enjoying that weather. Um, so that was, you know, one way I, I did it was just reaching out through my personal network and finding places where I could, um, you know, come in and hopefully educate some other people um, who may not have uh, had this information before. And then once you get comfortable with doing some of those smaller things, and they can be nerve wracking, especially if you're not, you know, you don't like public speaking and that kind of stuff, but it's so worth it. And everybody is very kind. Um, but once you get comfortable doing some of those little small things, then you can go bigger. Um, and the MRF gives us lots of opportunities to do that with Miles for Melanoma, with the gala. You can go to the gala, which is always a great time. You can volunteer at the gala, which is always a great time. Um, and then advocacy days, which I think is just amazing. Um, and that's, that's the big one for me anyway. So Jen, Terry Lynn, um, do y'all have anything to add to that about advice you would give to someone who's interested in advocacy? Um, I, I think K Kristen pretty much, you know, covered it all. Um, I was like, even jotting down ideas to like thinking, like brainstorming, like I'm, I feel like I'm constantly, thinking of ways, you know, to get involved or to, to keep up with the advocacy. So, I mean, as far as starting that, I don't know. I mean, I think you could start anywhere. I'm, the biggest help for me, I think was the MRF's website, um, because then I started pulling educational materials and stuff too. Um, and, you know, from there, then I started to find out, oh, well, we have a miles of miles from melanoma right here in Denver. And, oh, we have a gala. Um, so I found out about those things. And then I just kind of got on the mailing list so that I could start um, volunteering for those. I don't have, you know, a ton of time during the school year. Um, but during the summer, you know, if I can work things out. And since then, I've like recruited a few of my teacher friends to help with the gala. Um, so yeah, it's just it, you start with your circle and then you just kind of go and see where you can fit in um, or what is doable for you. You know, it's not like people are going to jump on there and be like, oh, you got to do this and this and this and this and this, you know, you, you pick and choose, like you do what, what comes naturally, I guess. And yeah. It, and I mean, I think every single person I have ever met in, you know, the years that I've been with MRF have been so you know, helpful and like nurturing and good listeners and just fun. Um, because, you know, we're kind of all in the same boat. We all went through it and, um, or some are going through it now, but just to be able to share that story is, is huge. Like connect with people. You, you just have to. So, yeah. Jen, I wasn't sure if you were about to speak or not, and I didn't want to cut you off if you had any kind of final thoughts on how people, um, what they should know or how they should get involved. 
I think they did a really good job of covering how to get involved. I think it's really important also when you can sign up for the information and kind of do your research, find the organizations that feel like they're a good fit for you. Kristen mentioned there was like the motorcycle club and she's not part of it, but there are a lot of different connections that have maybe shared interests. And so find the things that you really connect with because it's also, you don't have to do everything, which I also think that Cherilyn just touched on as well. Yeah, and that's a really good point. Um, we know that it can be, you are giving so much of yourself um, when you are advocating, whether you're out in your community um, or if you're you know, taking the time out of work, out of your life to come into DC and meet with lawmakers because it, it is a packed, packed day. Um, and that can, that can take its toll. So first of all, we thank all of you and all of our advocates everywhere for you know, sharing your lives with us, for your commitment to the melanoma community. How have the three of you found ways to take care of yourself through your advocacy work? One thing that I've done, I really prioritize my advocacy work. And so if I know it's not realistic to do something, I will say no. But especially with May being Melanoma Awareness Month, there's already a lot of other opportunities that are out there right now. But then I have actually, a, it just happens that this week I have a lot of advocacy things. So Friday, I took a half day from work so I could recharge before the week and the weekend. And then like next weekend at the end of this really busy week, I made sure that I had no plans on my calendar so that afterwards I have that ability to re-energize, recharge and rest. And so really incorporating self-care in other areas too, so that I am able to continue prioritizing the advocacy work. And for me, like having my um, friends and family involved, like having my daughter come to advocacy days with me um is great you know we we do the work we do we it is it's it's a real busy couple three days that we're we're doing this stuff um and it can be exhausting but then we usually take a day after that and we just kind of hang out we maybe do some sightseeing we we make a little vacation out of it it's really fun um I always try to set up um, a, a brunch with um, my Miles for Melanoma team after the event. Um, it starts early in the morning. So by the time we're all kind of wrapped up at the site, it's, it's about brunch lunch time, And we just celebrate. We just are like, this is, I, we just did a great thing. And hopefully we had some fun doing it. And let's all just hang out together for, and share a meal, you know? Um, and those things are, are to me just as important as, you know, any other part of it. Yeah. Carrie Lynn, how about you? How do you, you know, protect your peace as you're out there sharing, um, you know, what, what in many ways is a really trying time of your life. It can be, you know, a cancer diagnosis is a trauma. And when you're sharing your story with others, how do you kind of recognize when you need a break? Uh, that, that's a difficult question. I mean, I don't, I think that there's people like now that the word has spread throughout my, my building and even throughout my school district, um, because I've been in different buildings and sit different situations. Um, I think there's people that reach out to me. And so, you know, like I've got somebody right now that has one of their moles is getting checked and she reached out to me. And so I just kind of remind her to stay positive and to trust others, you know, to trust the doctors, find it early, you know, that sort of thing. But I feel like if it does start to weigh on me a little bit, then I can kind of pick and choose when I want to enter that conversation with them. Like I understand their fears. Um, and I went through phone buddy training a few years ago in Los Angeles through, through the MRF. 
And, you know, they talked about setting those boundaries for yourself. Like, yes, you want to volunteer, um, but when it starts to get overwhelming or you start to get scared about one of your future skin checks coming up or, you know, a funky mole that I have that I want to have checked coming up. There's times I, I don't talk about that. Like I may only talk, talk to my husband about it. Um, and my, maybe my mom. Um, but then I just kind of close everybody else off until I get through it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there's not, there's not really anything like it'll never go away. It's always going to be like this. It's, it's always there. So I can't say that I ever like step away from it, you know, like I, I, I keep myself busy quite a bit. And then when I need to take a break, I, I'll take a break and, um, but I, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't really know how else to answer that. You know, if I, if I need to take a break and take time for me, I take time for me. I get massages. I'll go get my nails done. I'll, you know, whatever. Um, but it makes me feel good to talk to people and reach out to people. And once I make that connection with people, I just, I love it. I thrive off of that. Well, we, we certainly love having all of you here with us. Um, it's tonight on the East Coast. I know not all of us are located there right now, and we are rapidly running out of time. So I do want to give our audience a chance to ask questions. Um, thank, thank you all for coming tonight, for um, you know sharing your story with us, sharing your passion with us. We really, as an organization, could not move the needle and advance care for the melanoma community without each and every one of you who has given your time, your you know energy, and uh, it is truly a privilege to see all of you in DC. So I am looking forward to 2024. And with that, I will turn it over to Miriam um, to pick up our audience questions. Kim, thank you. I couldn't have said it better myself. We are so grateful. Uh, we have three questions, so I'm gonna try and run through them pretty quickly because we are running out of time. But the first question is, I'm a four year 3B survivor. How does one find out where our best fit is for advocacy? Does anyone wanna answer that? I, I will. Um, I am a almost seven year 3B survivor. Um, and I, you know, I tried some different things before um, the MRF, I was, got hooked up with a cancer um support group and it was it was great it, it was all women i think there was like about 10 of us and it was really great lovely lovely people um the the issue i had with it was that all of the all of them except for me was um a breast cancer uh patient and It just, uh, quite honestly, it made me feel a little bit more alienated because melanoma was so, I didn't know anybody and I wanted to know somebody. I wanted to, to, to talk to somebody who had the same disease that I had that could be walking a similar path. And none of those women were. Um, that's not to say I didn't get something out of it. I did, but that was kind of like a swing and a miss. I tried it. I tried that support group. It wasn't the best fit for me. And so then I tried some other things and, and those worked out better. So it's hard to, it's hard to know what's going to be best for you. Um, you, um, but I will say, I will encourage you to, uh, get involved. Um, you know, maybe the, go to uh, a Miles for Melanoma race, or maybe go to um, advocacy days or the gala or something. Just try one thing. And I think that you'll find that everyone is warm and welcoming. And hopefully you'll find your people, you know, um, but that's, you know, only you know that for sure. But it's okay to try things and be like, you know what? I didn't, that wasn't for me. I'm not, I'm not going to do that again. That's okay. And, and give yourself a break about it. Absolutely. Kristen, we're all human and, and knowing ourselves mm. um, is such a gift, kind of knowing what feels right. So 
So thank you. The second question was about social media. Um, if if the people on the call today can find Kristen, Carolyn, and Jennifer. Um, so if you want to just, if you're okay with that, uh, Jen and Kristen, Carolyn already put her name, you can answer that um, right there. Oh, yeah. And then our last question of the evening, are any of the advocates currently undergoing treatment? Um, this, this person is asking that they'd love to be involved, but treatment is rough. Um, and she's wondering how others might juggle both getting involved and going through treatment at the same time. I can, I don't know if Kristen was getting ready to jump in on this one, but um, I, my first thought it would be to take care of you first and, and don't worry about the advocacy part. Like you work on educating yourself and you work on, you know, being strong and, um, you know, I guess learning about your therapy and how um, the treatment is like how your body's <laughs> responding to it and stuff, because there are a lot of emotions that go with such a raw uh, time in your life. Um, and, it, and like I said, it wasn't until years later that I even started um, into the ag advocacy role because I was so embarrassed. I was ashamed to have cancer at such a young age and to have not known, you know, to take care of my skin. And so I think you, I don't know, my first thought is to take care of you first. Um, and then if you can squeeze in pieces of adv advocacy, great, but you don't want to take on so much to where you're so overwhelmed that your body is not able to be the best that it can to fight this cancer. Um, and, and also it's, it's scary from what Kristen said too, you can't go out there and learn all these things because you will agonize. Well, if you're like me, <laughs> you'll agonize every single time, you know, am I doing this right? Or should I be doing this? Maybe I shouldn't be eat, eat this. Like I just became this worry wart. It was constant and constant anxiety. And, um, that's, I learned that that's just not healthy for you. So, I mean, if you're passionate and you want to do it, great but if not you've got to step back give yourself some grace and and take a breath and just take it one day at a time like okay i got this you know i'm moving on but you're gonna have you know good days and bad days and so i don't know if i would put that pressure on myself yeah i feel like for me I, it was about wasn't quite a year after my diagnosis um, I didn't, advocacy was the first, furthest thing from my mind. I, but once I felt like I got my health under control, then I was like, what, what can I do? What else can I do? I can do something. I feel I'm, I'm good now. I feel healthy. Um, and just knowing that there are other people, other patients out there who are not in a good place who are going through some pretty rough treatments um, and things like that. Um, it makes me even more passionate because I, I love, you know, you don't, your job when you're actively sick and actively getting treatment is to focus 100% on your health. Our job as as uh, survivors, people who are NED, is to remember what that's like and to do the advocacy work for the people who are um, really struggling right now. And then when you're ready, come join us. We'd love to have you. <laughs> I would echo both of what they said too, but I also think that even if you're not undergoing active treatment, it's okay. So I never advocated during treatment, but I also think it's okay to really take some time after your treatment is over and just see how you're doing mentally and emotionally. After my first diagnosis, about a year out, I found that I was really struggling mentally with the skin checks um, continually coming up. And then during that year, even though I never had immunotherapy or was undergoing active treatment because I kept having excisions. I was really struggling emotionally and stuff. And I can't imagine adding advocacy on top of that. So it's not just treatment, but really 
lean into um, and be in touch with how you're doing mentally and emotionally too. It can be really healing and help give you purpose, but it also can be a lot of work. And so um, I think it's okay to take the time and then jump in when you're ready. Or like we already mentioned, it's also okay to take a break. Thank you all for those beautiful responses and for really emphasizing the healing journey as well as getting connected. So please um, you know, reach out to us at the MRF with anything you may need. But with that, I'd like to thank all of you um, for today's Ask the Expert session. We appreciate all that you do for the melanoma community and appreciate you taking additional time to be with us this evening. Thanks again to ISI for their generous support of our Ask the Expert webinar series. And again, this program will be available on demand on our learning platform and also streamed to our social media channels at a later day. Um, at the end of the event today, like I said before, there will be an evaluation that will pop up in a browser on your screen. Please do fill out that evaluation. It provides us with such important feedback on today's session. We really appreciate that in advance. Additionally, um, please visit melanoma.org to learn more about our upcoming webinars, other educational opportunities like patient symposium in your town, in your academic center, or advocacy opportunities as well. If you have any other questions, please feel free to send us an email at education at melanoma.org. And with that, I just want to say thank you and thank you for joining us this evening. And we will see you again soon. Thanks, everyone.